All right, folks, so it is such an honor and privilege uh, to bring Kerry Meyer uh, to the podcast, the Josh Gandler podcast. I, I just, I am in hog heaven of having the opportunity to spend an hour with Kerry. Um, I knew uh, Dr. Meyer, uh, my one of my economics professors at George Mason back when I was there in the early to mid 90s. And uh, I just, I've always loved Carrie, a wonderful human being, um, but she also has a lot of just interesting uh, perspectives on all kinds of things. Latin America, which has always been near and dear to my heart, non-governmental organizations, agricultural policy, which I find fascinating. But then she had written a book uh, called Days on the Family Farm. And um, and so Carrie and I had kind of gotten out of touch after I graduated and whatnot, and somehow we came back in touch, and uh, she let me know about this book. And uh it just blew me away. I don't want to say it's a life changer for me because that'd be a little bit over the top, but it was it was pretty doggone close. It really started my um, interest in uh, you know pre electrical days, pre engines, uh, pre fossil fuels, and, and and not really pre, but just back in the day of when things were done. I think we can romanticize this a little bit too much, frankly, um, without realizing that there are some pain points that a lot of people have to deal with. So. Uh, so anyway, she has written another book, and I in my intro before I did this, I talked about those books. Uh, the other book was Letter from the uh, What's it called, Carrie? Letter Letters from the Boys. I'm looking Letters right from the Boys. Uh, yeah, Letters from Johnson, the Boys. With, yeah, go ahead. Johnson, go ahead. Uh-huh. World War One soldiers tell oh, right man. home. Absolutely. So, uh, so I want, that's the the brief. Well, not brief. Uh, my yap in here intro about Carrie. But Carrie, thanks so much for being on the call here today. Just. Welcome aboard. I am so excited to talk. Can you just share a little bit about who you are, what you are, what you've been doing, just your whole <laughs> you oh, right? take as long as you well, want, your whole background. <laughs> well, it's great to be here, Josh. There's not too many students I keep in touch with as from as far back as, as you were in my class, but it's really great to great to be here with you. And um so me um, well, I grew up on a farm in northern Illinois, right around uh, Rockford, Illinois. And um, let's see, I mean, other important things about my life, I served in the Peace Corps in the Dominican Republic, and I've been uh, teaching uh, economics at George Mason University for, well, ever since uh, 1988 almost. Um, so, so let's see. So the the days on the family farm. Oh, book wait, wait, hold on a sec. Let me interject. How did a farm girl end up as a uh, economics professor at George Mason? I mean, that's uh, what made you. Okay. Uh, what was the the story behind that? I I've, I've never heard this. So how did you end up doing that? That's fantastic. Well, um, actually, um, you know, I had a hard time making up my mind about what to study, and okay. um. So, and it ended up being economics because, um, because you know, partly because my mom used to tell me that my grandfather had always encouraged her to study economics. And uh, so I started to look into it and it seemed very flexible. And so I, so I studied economics and then I still didn't know what to do. So I joined the Peace Corps okay. and, um, and then it seemed like, well, um, I probably needed, you know, for most of the jobs I was interested in, I needed a master's degree or or even a PhD. So, um, so that's, you know, I went, after I got out of the Peace Corps, then I went back for my um, master's degree. And, of course, all the professors, you know, they encourage you to go on and, and get a PhD. So, so that's what I did. And so I became an economist and... Um, it's um uh, yeah, it's been a good good life for me to be an economist. It's worked out. Well. What was your, you know, you've written a lot about Latin America. What was your interest? You know, uh, you know, was there a keen interest in growing up in Latin America? Or what what was the? Uh, well, what, what, actually, when um when I was in grade school, uh, I had a, a teacher when I was in the fourth grade who she had been a Peace Corps volunteer in Ecuador. And okay. uh, so she was she was a very passionate uh, teacher. You know, we studied the Aztecs and the Mayas and and she encouraged us to take Spanish and, um, you know, learn about the world and, and yeah. um, you know, maybe, maybe join the Peace Corps, too. And so I, I ended up doing that, you know, basically because of, of her uh, influence okay. and, and her passion. 
That's fantastic. Um, and so you, you that was just because of her, you know, her encouragement just really led you to uh, to find interest in Latin America, and then obviously in your own studies about economics, and you combine the two because you had written a book on uh, sustainable. What did you write about sustainable development? I wrote I wrote a book. Um, it was actually my dissertation. I I wrote a book uh, on land reform in Latin America. Yes. That's right. Yes, the Dominican yes, yes. case, and so that that combined my interest in in agriculture with uh, Latin America. I was an agriculture volunteer in the in the Dominican Republic. And, what kind of um, farm were you raised on, Carrie? A dairy farm, or what? Uh, what uh, no, it wasn't dairy. It was it was we had uh, corn and uh, soybeans, and uh, we had um, some beef cattle. Uh, we used to have chickens when I was little. There was, a, you know, a few uh, sheep even uh, on the farm for a little while. So, um, you know, yeah. it was a gener general farm, but not dairy cattle because that was my dad was also a consulting structural engineer, so he didn't okay. he didn't farm full time. Now, do you have a garden, or is it you say, I'm done with all that, you know, being raised on a farm, I'm not raising any crops, or do you do any no. Uh, gardening? <laughs> no, we, we have a garden. My husband and I, um, yeah, we, w that's one of the things we like about Wheaton is that uh, we have a big backyard, and, uh, and uh, so we have a nice uh, garden. We've got a bunch of tomatoes, and, mm. and we still have some kale, actually, in our garden. So we, yeah, en right we enjoy that a lot. Yeah, well, me too. That's fantastic. So what brought you, tell us the story of the wonderful book, Days on the Family. Just the whole go into it, Kay, it's just such a wonderful story. It's it's almost, you know, serendipity, if you will. Some would call it that. I would actually say it's almost yeah. divine. Uh, uh, but tell us that whole story, if you will, please. It's amazing. Well, that was, yeah, that was uh, quite an exciting project for me because um, it was after my grandmother died that, um, you know, the area uh, around the farm where I had grew up, it had been changing very rapidly. And so, so after my grandmother died, I decided, oh, it would be nice to kind of write up something about, you know, the way it used to be and, yeah. and um so then um, my brother, who was um, living at the house um, for a while, at my grandmother's house after she died, um, he had been poking around up in the uh, attic in the upper you know, part of the house, and uh, he um, brought back all this big box of diaries. You know, they were little bitty books. You know, smaller than a, a regular agenda, maybe, you know, maybe like three by five or even a little oh. bit smaller than that. And there were dozens of these um, little diaries in the box. And um, and there were also uh, farm ledgers. These were much uh, bigger books. Uh, and they had, you know, all the expenses and um the income from the farm um yeah. and it ended up being from you know from 1901 to 1944 and this was this was a farm that i grew up on so it just i was just so excited about uh this project i worked on it like a, like a maniac really for uh for years and um you know it took me a long time to get it published but it, it came out Came out a lot better than I ever thought it would. You know, it it was ended up being a lot. You know, gave me something more, much more targeted to write about than um, you know than my initial kind of idea of a, of a little history. So I stuck pretty close to the the diaries and um, and 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 then I interpreted around there and filled yeah. in. Uh, descriptive information. So, um, so it it um, it came out. You know, it kind of brought to life an age that is um, is gone, really, for forever. And yeah. um, there's uh, still, you know, quite a few people out there that that remember, you know, stories and remember uh, history. 
uh, as it was told and have pictures and know their family history. But um, but it's really an, an era that is that is gone um, now. Um, but um, but it's a it's a good read. Uh, for those people who did grow up on farms, it brings back uh, lots of memories, and it's a way to, um, you know, to remember and, and treasure uh, the history of of those uh, Midwestern uh, farms. And so your brother was just poking around the attic and just, you know, happened across these boxes uh, full of your grandma's handwritten ledgers. Well, they, they, it wasn't actually my grandmother. They were in okay. my grandmother's house. Oh, but, gotcha, gotcha. Um, okay. But it was uh, the woman who kept the diaries and ledgers. She was married to a double first cousin of my great grandfather. Oh, okay. So she wasn't really, you know, a blood relative of mine. Okay. But, but her husband, Elmo Davis, was um was was kind of like a um you know a father figure to my grandfather because my grandfather's parents died when he was a young man so um so initially i was i was very interested in learning more about my grandfather from these diaries because the the diaries started you know 1901 so my my grandfather was just a, a little boy you know, about five years old when the when the diaries um, started. <laughs> but how did they end up in your grandma's attic? I mean, I, I don't. Well, my know, grandfather. Did... Okay, so so the woman who kept the diaries, her name was May, and right. um, and so my uh, grandfather was the closest blood relative to her husband, Elmo Davis. Okay. So okay. my grandfather was the executor of uh, Elmo's estate and the farm was passed on to uh, my mother and her sister and um so I so I grew up on that farm. Okay, uh, so man. so the yeah. diaries were about the farm that, that I grew up on. And so I could you know I I knew Sort of the, I mean, the names, the people that she talked about were all familiar to me, yeah. and the places I could sort of, you know, visualize the the horses going across the the landscape down in the creek, and and uh, so it was just a, a very exciting project for me, and and I, you know, I worked on it nonstop for for many years, and uh, eventually. Got it. Got it published um, by a great publisher um, for for the book, the um, University of Minnesota uh, Press. Did they so in, do much in way of editing? I mean, I don't know how you would even edit that because it's literally first person. I mean, you know what I'm saying, Carrie? Did they? Well, yeah, I mean, but I mean, I did that editing. I mean, I didn't. I, yeah, okay. I you know <laughs> did the writing around the. Um, use the diary diary entries, you know, right. in a in a descriptive way. Um, but um, actually, it was it was a, a hard book to write because the material was so close to me, you know. So right. I did I did get uh, I actually hired an, an editor to help me cut it down at some okay. point because okay. the the book ended up being you know bigger and more detailed than uh, than would make more sense. For, for most people to read, so so we kind of chopped it chopped it down and got it in a much more readable uh, stage. I wrote a new uh, introduction uh, because I, I wanted to to start the whole project with uh, when the when Northern Illinois was first settled, and so I have that uh, background yeah. uh, too. But um, but you know the the project that needed to be kind of trimmed, and so I did get some help with that. But uh, um, my editor at uh, the University of Minnesota Press, he had a lot of um, a lot of good suggestions. Um, but I was you know I was really glad that they didn't suggest anything that I didn't really want to do, and so um, so I was really happy with the way it came out. And lots of pictures in there too. Yeah. Well, how do you? I mean, you're writing. I just 
the length of time it must have taken just because you're reading these this uh, stuff about people who are they're real people. I mean, the real people to me, but real, real people to you. And I imagine you just sat there, yeah. and put your pen down, and just had to just reminisce and think. Yeah, I just think. I remember. It's not just like you're reading a book. I mean, you're. It's almost like you're going back into. Well, not almost. You're literally going back in time, in terms of memories of your own life and your own family right. history. And I just, I can only imagine that. <laughs> That'd be hard to do in terms of one yeah. sitting or two because you just keep thinking and thinking and thinking. In some yeah, ways, I imagine was. it might have been emotional. Yes, yes, it, it definitely was. I mean, I spent uh, long hours in particular, not just thinking, you know, but but uh, transposing the diaries. I mean, I, I um, you know, typed up every diary and completely basically and so so that was a lot of a lot of the time where you would just be sort of thinking and and kind of meditating on this and and that but i was you know that i put that time to work productively retyping you know or typing really for the first time the diaries and then once i did that i could search on uh on keywords like if i was going to write up something about you know, the transition from horses to um, automobiles, you know, I yeah. could search on horses and, and learn, you know, everything in the diaries about horses, or I could search on, on you know, automobiles or tractors or, or things like that. And um, so it was, it was, well, it was a lot of work. It, I, yeah. I really... I really was uh, very, very involved uh, in that book, um, so um, and it's it's done pretty well. It was that was um, published in two thousand seven, I think. Yeah. And, um, um, you know, at the at the time when I got it published, really, I hadn't been that active in the um, scholarly c community of agricultural historians, but um, but subsequently, I've I've um, you know, been been more active in the Agricultural History Society, and so it's, the book has been received pretty well, both in the academic world, but also, you know, my main audience was really um, people who grew up on farms, and so yeah. so those people do seem to really uh, enjoy the book as, as well, especially you know the the Midwestern uh, farm families. So the I'm, people who like the idea of you know, stepping back in time and seeing how things used to be. Um, yes. Because it's, it's the transition from horses to, you know, gas engine vehicles, you know, it, it's, uh, I mean, it happened and we kind of like, oh, yeah, you know, the, the, the horse and buggies, you know, we kind of like, you know, we make light of that, but it really happened and there are really people who were uh, affected by that in real ways in terms of, you know, everything right. that goes along with that and your book, literally puts you in the eyes of the per, of the uh of the of your the grandparents of may and i forgot elmo right <laughs> may, is that right yes, yeah may and, and elmo uh, yeah it's uh yeah now i would say not only the agricultural you know education but there's just a historian generally speaking i mean if you like to live through the eyes of you know contemporary or whatever it is people that that book it's 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 just a literal history of that i, I find it fact and i will say care at the end of the day I mean, what you have done here is preserve that forever. I mean, that's, that's, you know, thankfully the, you know, her writings were not burned in a fire or a lightning strike or thrown out right. like, uh, like, you know, baseball card collections by mom. When the kid moves out to go to college, they throw out all the Babe Ruth rookie cards, or whatever. <laughs> thankfully that didn't happen. Right. Yes. It's, it's, it's remarkable that, that they were preserved and, um, and also that she had the, the, the time to keep such detailed records i oh, guess as i mentioned amazing. you know she and her husband didn't have any children and so that's part of the reason why why she had um time to devote to record keeping and um she did really keep um detailed um financial records too and um and that was really helpful particularly in you know looking at the technology because you could you could see you know exactly when they purchased the new gasoline engine and yeah. how much it costs and you know when they purchased the tractor or an automobile 
and uh, how, you know how much they paid the hired men and what their hours were. All of those kinds of details were um, available. So, um, so it was it was a really interesting project. Um, and for me, as a, as an economist, you know, I I felt um, you know justified in devoting the time to it that I did because it it you know was really a lot of um, valuable primary research. You had one story that jumps out at you. I mean, if all, it's just so many stories and fascinating, you know, pieces of just interesting tidbits. If anything, one thing jumped out at you about Elmo and May, uh, anything jump out at you, Carrie, that would, you say, this is one thing that I, I really took away from, you know, your research and writing of the book. Well, there are a number of things, but, but um, it really, it's, it, it, does a good job of presenting, as you as you mentioned too, the transition from from horses to uh, automobiles and yeah. uh, tractors. You know, one thing that surprised me a lot was how long they used the horses after they already had the automobile. Okay, so so you know they bought an automobile about 1909. But they still had horses in 1944. Okay, so yeah. So usually, you know, we think about that transition was, you know, you buy a car or an automobile, or you know, buy an automobile and get rid of the horses. But it didn't happen that way at all because, um, you know, they they used all of these things concurrently. They had they had a tractor in uh, 1926, and they still used horses. You know, actually, I think Elmo bought a new horse in, in maybe 41, 1941 or something even. Um, to plow the fields or, or what's the, uh, why? Why, well, why would he? Yeah, yeah but the horses were a very, a very flexible power source. And, you know, Elmo was, um, you know, he was an older guy by, by that time and he was, that's, what he was most accustomed to using, yeah, but right, right. Um, you know, for the smaller farms, the horses were were very valuable. Uh, horses were very valuable for field work in in general. They knew what they were doing, and um, you know, you could use you know a whole team of horses for a job that required a lot of power, or you could use two horses for something else. You could use one horse, you know, and um, so um, I think we. We don't really appreciate how valuable the horses were, and it took a long time to develop um, really useful tractors. You know, the yeah. tractors, uh, the early tractors were uh, nothing like, um, you know, the um, tractors of, of today. You know, they they kept improving, improving, improving all the time, um, but. Um, you know, it wasn't until the mid '30s that tractors had rubber tires, and so you know, tractors just got got better and better. Um, you know, really starting in the in the mid '30s. But how about uh, I was reading something actually not that long ago. I think it was literally in the last week or so. A guy was talking about the productivity in terms of food production has. Uh, spiked up significantly because we don't have to keep so much land to feed the horses. I, and, uh, I don't know if you right. have any comments on that, but I mean, yeah. so going back to, you know, Elmo and having, you know, four or five horses, um, I mean, how much, I, I, it's got to take a lot to feed those things. You know what I'm saying? And, and yeah, uh, food's got to come it, from someplace. Yeah, it, that's, that's true. It, it, it did take, take a lot to feed him. But he, he used to, I mean, you could also see that, that over that period of time, he had horses all that time, but he had fewer horses, you know. So, yeah. so he cut back, um, you know, after they bought the automobile, you know, they, they didn't have as many horses. And certainly yeah, after no, they bought right. the tractor, then they didn't have as many, you know, they had a couple of horses instead of having, you know, a, maybe a dozen. You know, so and someone was saying um, like like acres. That I, I was and again, Carrie, I don't remember the exact number, but it's like for every five horses, you need two acres of. I, and I'm literally I pulling out of the air. I don't know exact, but I was, I was stunned. I was like, they need to devote that much land to and it's, yeah. you know raising the hay for a hor or whatever it is for horses, so they can grow food on the remaining plots of land. I just thought that was 
Right. Yeah, it was very interesting. Yeah, they did. Yeah. Plus, yeah. plus, they all grew oats for the horses too. You know, yeah, there was right. grazing yeah. land, but also they they ra- raised oats um, to um, to feed the horses. So the horses weren't weren't cheap, and it you know it it there was a point at which uh, it really made sense to to get a tractor, but. Um, but people still tell me that even in the 1940s, if you had less yeah. than 40 acres, it didn't make sense to get a tractor because the, the horses, yeah. the horses were um, were more versatile and more appropriate for the smaller farms. You know, the Amish still use horses. Right. And <laughs> yeah, and they men and I do. No. Yeah. Yeah, so horses are are still valuable in the field. You know, the thing that they the the, the gasoline engine was was really important at, uh, for stationary work at the very beginning uh, because horses, you know, on the treadmill or or walking around in a circle to power a horsepower uh, right. gear. I mean, that was not a very efficient way to um, to develop power. So the gasoline engines, when they came in, in about like Elmo bought a gasoline engine in 1906. You know, that was that was a very exciting time, too. And um, and that's sort of an underrepresented um, part of the history. And um, it's something that I've I've devoted um, quite a bit more time to uh, subsequently after I published this. Um, book uh, days on the family farm, um, and actually, it sort of led me into this next uh, project, uh, the letters from the boys, because um, because I had this interest in the gasoline engine. Yeah. And um, and I learned about the fact that uh, these farm boys were uh, they w- had a lot of skills in uh, gasoline engines. Uh, so when it came time for uh, World War One. Um, you know, all these, these farm boys that went off to war, uh, they brought a lot of human capital with them. Um, you know, they they were skilled with, with horses, which were still used in World War I, but they were um, also very skilled in with the gasoline engines, uh, which were used for ambulances and tanks and uh, submarines and airplanes and, and all of that uh, for the first time uh, during World War I. What um real quick on Elmo's far so the get was he using the gasoline engine uh, for like a, a pump to move water or what was the initial what, what yeah, he well, initially Elmo, used the, okay mm-hmm. he he used the gasoline engine uh, quite a bit in the winter time to cut wood because he still oh. uh, heated mm-hmm. his home uh, with wood so they used the gasoline engine for that they also used it um, for uh, grinding seed. Um, okay. And um, there were there were a lot of gasoline engines in the neighborhood. You could tell that they were kind of different sizes because you know there would be they they also had a gasoline engine with a group of men and they you had a bigger one you know that they used for uh, threshing. So okay. you know, instead of using a steam engine for threshing, they would use a, a big uh, gasoline engine. Um, but they were using them for mixing concrete too in the neighborhood. Okay. Um, they used them to run elevators. Pumping water was was another um, use of the gas engine for um, small, you know, the smaller engines uh, as well. And and you had written, I think, uh, about gas engines in Wisconsin. It wasn't a book, but it's a uh, a research paper or something. Carrie, you had written. Yeah, well, I have. In the in the Wisconsin Magazine of History, that's published by the Wisconsin Historical Society. I, yeah, I had a article on Wisconsin gas okay. engines, and I had another article in the Indiana Magazine of History about um, the um, gasoline engine applied to washing machines. Oh so, man! Um, that's, yeah, so it, women uh, use gasoline yeah. engines too, although they usually got help from from their husband to get the engine started. But they were but interesting. Really That's one of the things that I was reading about uh, the rural uh, electrification, you know, under FDR. And love them or hate them doesn't matter. The facts are that the women loved having electric electricity to help them yes. with washing clothes. Is that uh, is all over the, the the It's amazing. I, I I mean, Frank, I didn't. I mean, I knew, but I didn't know until I read a uh, some of the 
the notes that women had said to reporters and obviously their own diaries about, you know, thank goodness electricity's here so they can not grind so much on the washing of clothes. So I'd like exactly. to read your articles. Um, if you don't mind, um, if you could, I'll, and if, if, it's, if it's free, I, I don't know, it's not. I'll put all the stuff in the show notes, my friends. So I'll put all links to Carrie's books and, of course, these articles as well. Uh, Carrie, are, can these two articles on the gas engines, can they, they be found on the website? Or do you have, can you send me a PDF or something of them? Or? Um, I don't think I can send you a PDF because, okay. but, but you put link to the. Um, yeah, I'll link to the journals. Absolutely. That's fine. Um, yeah. So now, all right. So the gas engine thing. How, I'm just curious. Where where do they get the gasoline from? They didn't have gas. Do they have gas stations? Back? I mean, I, this might sound ignorant. I just don't know. But yeah, where, where no, it's a good it's a good question. I mean, they were using uh, kerosene for lighting their homes um, yeah. at the time. So um, so they would actually they sold the gasoline. You know, the same places they were selling the kerosene. It was pretty readily available, and it was not expensive because it was a byproduct. Of you know at the time it was a byproduct of the kerosene, and um, so gasoline you know started to to become more available. And since they were you know the using the gasoline engines, those were those were becoming popular before the automobiles came out. Then you know it 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 wasn't um, yeah the, the gasoline was wasn't in in short supply then. Although you know way back in the early 1900s they were. Um, you know, thinking about what what happened when we ran out of oil and switching yeah, to, right. to um, you know alcohol uh, instead, and and you know the problem of uh, batteries uh, not you know not uh, keeping a, a charge uh, long enough to to compete with the gasoline. All those things you know have been problems for over. Over well over a hundred years. Yeah. Lead acid batteries cool. go back many years. You know what I'm saying? It's funny that we still have lead acid ba- acid batteries. Uh, right. Still dominating exactly. the market. You would have thought the technology yeah. after a hundred years would change. Let's um. Right. Let's, I do want to switch.